everything that's happening a week later since the season has been removed. Rob Motti joins us from the Associated Press, covers the Eagles, and he joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline as the Eagles coaching search continues. How many guys are they up to now, Rob? Like 15? Uh, man, it's a ton of guys. And uh, you, you, one thing you can't say about them is they're rushing this process. They are certainly doing a thorough and exhaustive search for their next head coach. And honestly, guys, I don't have a problem with that. I know a lot of people are poking fun at them for this. And you're seeing a lot of people on Twitter, oh, I'm interviewing next week and I'm interviewing <laughs> tomorrow. I don't, I don't see the rush. Let, let, let them take as much time as they need. They got to get it right. And the, there's no guarantee by taking time. It means they're going to get it right. But I got to give, you know, I'm as critical of the Eagles as everybody. But in this particular situation, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and at this point, it's down between them and Houston. So I don't know how much crossover there is in interviews. They, I feel like they can take their good old time now when it's down to two. But is there for you, Rob, a guy that got away maybe? I like Robert Salah, and I thought that he would be a guy who would be a great fit for Philly. But just because he's a great fit for Philly as far as a defensive guy, I think the mentality of the city – is always geared towards a tough, hard-nosed leader, defensive guy. But just because I feel that way doesn't mean he was the right fit. And, of course, the Jets scooped him up faster. Uh, I liked Brian Dable in Buffalo, but I reported that he was just going to stay put for now. Um, I thought that he had a lot of good credentials for this particular job. You know, I, I look at some of the other names right now. I'm not overwhelmed by anyone, but at the same time, guys, like, who was overwhelmed or excited about Doug Peterson, right? And he won a Super Bowl. And you can go back to Charlie Manuel. That was maybe one of the more criticized hires in Philadelphia sports history, and he won a World Series. So I I will wait to make my determination and evaluation until I know who they picked and see what that guy can do in two years. Now, when you – Dable is my favorite guy. I think he would be a great influence for Carson to work with him. Carson can say, hey, you really worked well with Allen. I'm intrigued. I think that would be a nice story. Are you kind of, uh, like, raising your eyebrow as to why he's not even interested in taking an interview here? I'm not because I believe that he has some information about the situation, and he's a guy who – most likely next year with another year in Buffalo and the, the confidence that he's got, he has in Josh Allen and his offense to have another successful season, he might be the hottest candidate out there and he can have his pick of situations. So, you know, I, I reported that he wanted to stay put and he was really, he had connections to the chargers. He had connections. He still has connections to Houston, but that seems to be a very undesirable position right now. So I think that factors into it. I I was able to hop on a call with him yesterday and ask him about how important is the culture, how important is the fit. And he said, yeah, obviously that is very important. And uh, maybe, you know, I don't want to say he didn't want to interview for the Eagles because of what appears to be a dysfunctional front office situation, but you also can't overlook that fact too as well. And I think maybe part of this, exhaustive search that the Eagles are undergoing is to kind of disprove that theory because a lot of us have put out there the fact that, Hey, this might not be the, uh, the most attractive job in the NFL. So what happens if they come back and interview 15, 16, 17 people, they'd be like, Hey, yeah, you, y'all said that this wasn't all that uh, exciting of a, a job. We interviewed all these people who would have been happy to accept this job. And we offered to the, this particular candidate who's the best that we found. The enemy was the most intriguing option around the league prior to all the hirings occurring. What happened? Yeah, it's it's very interesting because his name has picked up steam over the last couple of years. You heard Andy Reid yesterday say tremendous things about him. Uh, Patrick Mahomes says a lot of great things about him. Uh, I've been on a uh, in, in the quarterback coaching summit where I've heard him give a presentation, but I don't know how he interviews. And only teams who interview him can tell you, if they're honest with you, what it is that made them shy away or go in a different direction. I haven't heard anything. I don't know what that is, but that's the only explanation at this point because it's, it seems like, hey, he's worked with one of the best offenses. He's got this great offensive mind. Yeah, why not? He should be the next candidate. 
So maybe he does end up getting a job in Houston. I'm going to wait until these two positions are filled before we, you know, we talk about whether or not they, Eric Bieniemy got a job. But it, he certainly, I thought that the Eagles were going to bring him in. Still don't have any confirmation on that as of yet. Uh, we saw the tweet that was put out by his agency yesterday, which was very interesting. And I think it raised a lot of eyebrows down there at the NovaCare facility. So uh, I don't know, guys. I really don't know about Eric Bieniemy right now. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And then, of course, there's Mike Kafka, who seemed like he was intriguing. And then all of a sudden, poof, like a puff of air, not interested anymore. Is that similar to uh, the Brian Dable thing, that maybe he was just not all that intrigued with what's going on here? I, I don't have that information, to be honest with you. I don't know that. And, and, I, and I wonder if the Eagles also maybe are shying away from the look of that, the optics of hiring Doug Peterson from Kansas City and then going with another guy like Mike Kafka from Kansas City and mm-hmm. overlooking Eric Bieniemy. Like, if you're going to hire somebody from the Chiefs, how could you overlook Eric Bieniemy, pass him over, for Mike Kafka. I don't think that's going to look good for any team in the NFL. So uh, I, I wonder if that was played into part of what the Eagles was, are thinking at, at this point. Josh McDaniel seems to be the name with most buzz. What do you think about the reports claiming that Howie Roseman is kind of trying to get Jeffrey Lurie to buy into that? Yeah, I'm not sold on that <laughs> at this point. You know, we, we know where reports come out of at Novacare. OK, we know where they come and, and they are really good at spinning stories the way they want to sell them. And as Michael Lombardi pointed out last week in a very well done article for The Athletic, he said the NFL front offices are really good at creating a myth that they want to sell as truth, regardless of how much truth or accuracy there is to it. So that just might be a situation where it's trying to be perception Uh, I would think Jeffrey Lurie and his affinity for the Patriot way would be the one leading the charge for Josh McDaniels. But uh, I don't know. Otherwise, uh, I I just think that may be a little bit of some kind of spin coming out of Novacare. All right. Uh, Rob Motti from the Associated Press. uh, Do you rank Josh McDaniels as the overwhelming favorite or is he just another guy of the 11 guys who have interviewed at this point? Based on the buzz, I would say he's the favorite. Mike, I wouldn't use the term overwhelming because if he was, they're still continuing with this process and there's still other guys that they're bringing in. So I wouldn't say overwhelming. I would say he's probably the favorite and it's, it's going to be something where, you know, maybe they're waiting for somebody to come in there and just blow them out of the water. And Andy Reid type with that thick, remember the binder that Andy walked in there with this legendary binder and these uh, meticulous notes on how to run an organization and how to call, uh, how to run practices and news conferences and starting it off with the times yours and the engine, all that. Maybe they're waiting for somebody to blow them away. Uh, at this point, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really put my money down on any particular candidate just yet. All right. Well, what about some of the guys that out of the blue interview today, Dennis Allen, um, the uh, Kellen Moore, Kellen Moore, uh, Sirianni. Yeah. I mean, these are guys whose names Moore was reported about a week or so ago, but Sirianni has come out of right field. Dennis Allen. I mean, are these guys that have a shot? I mean, what do you make of that? I think everybody who interviews has a shot. Sirianni's name intrigues me because he comes from Indianapolis where he's worked with Frank Reich. And if the Eagles are going to move forward and keep Carson Wentz here, it would make the most sense to have somebody who is affiliated with Frank Reich in any way, shape, or form because obviously Carson thrived under Frank Reich. So Sirianni's a name that interests me. Oh, you forgot about Fossil too, right? He's a name who's going to come in here, a special teams coach who's going to get an interview. Uh, and when you think special teams coach, you go, oh, how about John Harbaugh? He's the guy who made that lump and uh, made that jump and made it so successfully. Uh, could Fossil be that guy? He's had coaching in his blood, in his genes. Sirianni's name is the one that intrigues me the most, and obviously it's because of the connection to Frank Reich. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really interesting. You know, these names are just kind of coming out of nowhere, and you're wondering how many more are there. Yesterday, Todd Bowles. <laughs> uh, you know, do they have a list of guys? They're just going to keep on going, and you wonder what's the angle here? Are they trying to get more information? And some of these guys are they interested in other capacities? I mean. Uh, and, and then I guess, Rob, a lot of roads go down the Deuce Road, and you wonder, I mean, you know he's the fan's favorite. And I, and you know, Deuce, you've been around him a lot, and you know, like, mm-hmm. I wonder, and I'm not questioning Deuce in his credentials. I'm just wondering, would he be the popular candidate if he didn't play running back for this team a couple of years ago? And you hear, oh, he's been a good soldier. You know, you never. I don't think anybody's ever said, hey, you know what I want? The, the running back coach from another team to be my head coach. So is Deuce in your mind – a legitimate top level candidate that they are realistically considering. I think you have to put them in that category. And by doing a search like this, where it is this extensive. And then if you want to sell do Staley to your fan base, you, it's not as if you interviewed, we interviewed four guys and Deuce was the best among them. If they're sold on Deuce and they want somebody who has been in the building who defensive players would run through a wall for. So obviously the offensive players also like this guy and you want to be able to sell to your fan base or to sell to everyone that he was the best candidate, not just popular, but the best. Well, then it makes sense to interview as many people as possible and maybe have some of those people join the the coaching staff. So I wouldn't discount Deuce Staley because you do have to consider the fact guys that, this is an organization where you have an owner who's going to be meddlesome and you have a general manager who has a lot of personnel control and you're going to need a head coach who's going to be fine and okay with that. That's why I think Josh McDaniels may not be a fit. Do Staley would be a better fit. So it's, it, that's what's going to be the most interesting thing for me is who's the guy and how's whoever it is. One of the first questions I know, I'm going to want to ask him is how important is personnel control to you as a head coach? Yeah, I was going to say, I agree with you that you never really know what you're going to get with the new hire, sort of like what we saw out of Doug Peterson. But when you look at Josh McDaniels, you see the history with Denver. You see the backing out with the Indianapolis Colts. And, you know, the Patriots without Tom Brady this year, albeit, you know, Cam Newton is what he is. They were limited. Should there be a little bit of concern based off of that history? I think so. You know, when – he backs out of a job that ultimately cost the Eagles Frank Reich. They have to sit there. And I know his explanation for that was it was a family situation and they didn't want to uproot, but then you accepted the job a couple of weeks prior. So I think that's got to be a little bit of a concern where you ask him, like, what's your commitment level? <laughs> Are we going to find out in a year or two that you don't want to be here anymore? So I think they got to, they really have to, to question that. I'll tell you one thing about Josh McDaniels, because the first thing that comes to my mind, When I think of the name Josh McDaniels, it's Tom Brady, like, cursing him out on the sideline. So that's one thing he's not going to have to worry about here if Carson Wentz or Jalen Hurts are his quarterback. They don't have that kind of DNA. All right, Rob Motti, Associated Press, covers the Eagles a long time. And, of course, uh, uh, the article that came out about Carson, you tweeted uh, over the weekend from Jeff McClain. You tweeted, I feel Carson Wentz needs a fresh start and the Eagles need to rebuild. Now, there's been so much talk about Carson, and we wonder after reading that, whether true, not true, whatever, how does Wentz walk back into that locker room and, like, everything's status quo? I mean, no matter what, true or not, he's in a really tough spot. I'll say this. I know Jeff to be an excellent reporter, and I have tremendous respect for him. I will also say if you want to write that article a completely different way, you'll find plenty of players who will speak on the record honestly and tell you how much they support Carson Wentz and what they really think of him as a good and a great teammate. Guys like Jason Kelsey, guys like Fletcher Cox, guys like Boston Scott, who I spoke to. So I think that's a matter of who do you want to speak to and how do you want to write it? So, uh, you know, I, I have no reason to doubt that Jeff got a player to say what he said anonymously about Carson. And I have no reason to doubt that Jeff got a most likely former assistant coach who's no longer here to say what he wanted, what he said about Carson in that situation. I just don't think that's the consensus Mm -hmm. in the locker room based on the players who I know, who I trust and who have no reason to lie about it. 
So and, and, of course, what I know about Carson Wentz and the person he is and the guy that he is. So that's why I don't think it would be a problem for him to walk into that locker room. And I, I still feel like he could be a team leader. Uh, I do think that Carson Wentz has flaws. He's got flaws on the field, for sure. We've seen that. He had a terrible season. And I'm sure he's got some character issue flaws as in can he relate to one through 65 on the roster, the 53 men on the roster and the, the practice squad and everyone else. I know he's close with a certain group of guys, and I understand that. But as the quarterback of a football team, you have to be able to be relatable to the offense, the defense, and special teams. And perhaps that's an area that he's going to need to improve on. I just a few minutes ago got off the phone with a uh, safety for the Green Bay Packers, Adrian Amos. And what he talked about when we were talking about Aaron Rodgers, he talked about his relatability. And I was like, wow, light bulb went off. I'm like, how about that? He's like, Aaron is just so relatable to everybody on the team, makes you want to play for him, do this, do whatever. I wonder if that's an issue with Carson. And if it is, he's got to address it. Yeah, um, and, and I agree. I think that's a great point that you make. If Rob Motti wants to write a story about how much support you're going to find guys who are going to talk. It's not that all 53 men despise this guy or think that he's a problem, um, but some of the things that you're hearing, you do question, can he lead a team if guys are saying, hey, He's making us look bad. He's not taking accountability. Those are the things that I think are the most damning, more so than, you know, whatever. He doesn't get along with everybody, which, you know, you're not going to, not everybody's going to like it. You're not going to get along with everybody. But if the, some of the veterans on that team feel like you're not taking accountability, I think that's where I wonder, hey, can you walk back in there and, and have the support of everybody? That's a good point. And it depends on who that veteran player is. And if that's a veteran. Uh, offensive lineman who's outgoing and is known for being selfish. Well, that's one thing. If that's a veteran offensive lineman <laughs> who's going to be part of the team going forward, then you got to address that. I can tell you it's not Jason Kelsey. We know what he thinks about Carson Wentz, yeah. and he said it on the record. So it, I, it, it really, Mike, it depends on who it is and what their situation is. You know, if it's if it's an outgoing wide receiver who played four games in the past two years, you know, it depends yep. on who it is and who said it. <laughs> That and, and I think the other part is, you know, it's hard to to say if he's going out there changing the plagues rogue because he just doesn't want the. I mean, that to me is is borderline insubordinate. Yeah, and I think that that would be cause for not only benching but suspension. Now, I will tell you this: I've spoken to Doug Peterson, and Jeff is not the one who reported that they had a fractured relationship in Jeff's article. He referred to the ESPN report. So when I spoke to Doug about it, mm -hmm. he just said that that's just, and we spoke about this last week, guys. Doug said that's just not the case, that that is not accurate, that's not true, and that he had a good relationship with Carson Wentz. And, and you know, I say that, and then people go, oh, well, and if they're such good friends, how come the offense didn't? I, they could be, they could have a great working relationship and tremendous respect for one another. And Carson may still feel that the offensive system doesn't fit his strengths, right? So you can respect someone, have a good relationship with them, bond with them over faith, as they both did. I know that for sure. And still not like the offensive system that he called for him and ran for him. Yeah, where I'm having the problem digesting that killing the play part of the article is, you know, Laurie mentions how many times about having an elite offense. And if Carson Wentz is just killing all these plays for the, quote, pissing match with Doug Peterson, and the offense was as putrid as it was, you're telling me Carson Wentz just continues to get trotted out there with nothing? Like It just it doesn't make sense. So I'm having a hard time trying to add that up. Yeah, I, I know that terminology and uh, who uses kind of terminology, pissing match. And, and, and I, I just think that was agenda driven, not on Jeff's part, but on the person hmm. giving out that information. I can't imagine Carson Wentz would purposely kill a play to the detriment of the team. I, I, just, I, can't, ima I can't believe that. I really can't. I, because then you, you got to bench the guy then you can't bring the guy back. Then you have to trade him regardless. And by indications are, when you hear that Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman are sitting down with candidates saying, how are you going to fix Carson Wentz, which is understandable because of all the money they invested in him, it appears that they're not leaning in that direction. 
So why would you go in at the right? Why would you want to keep somebody if that is the case? Rob, how much voice did Wentz have on draft free agents, the organization? I mean, did he have a loud voice in terms of how this roster looks right now? Well, if he did, he certainly wouldn't have drafted Jalen Hurts. (laughs) <laughs> and if he did, right? You know, if, if he did, he certainly wouldn't have drafted J.J. Arcega Whiteside. And and uh, I still want to give Jalen Rieger an opportunity. I think he still has a chance. I, I kind of feel that the Eagles try to fit players into a system and a fit with the quarterback rather than taking maybe the best. So I, his influence wasn't necessarily, hey, Carson, here's our draft board. Who do you want? Because yeah. it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Isn't that but kind of influence, yeah. isn't that kind of what when Andy was here, wasn't that kind of like it, you know, it's the system, it's not the players. We draft guys that fit into what we do. I mean, Andy, they didn't draft receivers very well during that era either. Now you can say, well, they never won the Super Bowl, but it seemed like year after year, well, they have no receivers. They have no receivers. They have no receivers. And, the, and we always were like, the guy's so arrogant that he thinks you could just plug anybody into his system. Yeah, and I think that's part of their failures in the draft is right. that they they continue to go in that direction and they try and fit a guy into a scheme or they try and fit a guy into a need. And I, I do remember Howie Roseman maybe two, three years ago sitting down in that pre-draft and I said, we just got to take the best player available and not try and take for need. But they never do that. <laughs> and they end up never doing that because they don't take the best player available. So I've had a lot of conversation with some Eagles people about the draft. I'm trying to figure out, guys, because we look at the draft failures and we go how glaring and how obvious. And, and a lot of people want to point me to go examine all the other teams. We, we look at the Eagles, right? But we don't, I'm like, well, I don't cover Seattle. I'm going to go look at Seattle. Well, look at Seattle. They took DK Metcalf, but who'd they take in the first round? Did he pan out? Who'd they take here? Did he pan out? So, yeah, I, I, I think we, we overemphasize the draft as we should because mm-hmm. it's the team that we cover and it's the team in our city. But who's? I want to find out who has the most say. How do they go about picking guys? I know how he ultimately is going to take the blame because he's the guy in charge. But what if some of these picks that they've made over the past couple of years were Joe Douglas picks? What if they were someone else's picks and that guy's not here? I don't know that yet. Yeah. I, I, and, look, I know everybody – hates Howie and wants him gone. I kind of tend to go with you where, look, Jeffrey said it the other day, and I know people don't hear He says, our track record in 20 years, and that's why Roseman doesn't go. He doesn't just have a knee-jerk reaction because they had a bad season. He says, look, over a 20-year span, the two of us together have had a pretty good run, so I'm going to stick with this guy. And I know it's frustrating for the fans to hear, but they know they're not winning a Super Bowl every year. They want to be competitive every year, and they've pretty much accomplished that as a duo. You're right. I mean, they won a Super Bowl three years ago, so it, it's hard to look past that. And, and we do because, you know, we analyze the team. But the role of a general manager has evolved. And, and I, now I sound like a Howie apologist, which is the last thing <laughs> I really am. But, but the, the truth of it is, is that the role of a GM has evolved beyond just the draft, just signings. And there are aspects of Howie's job that he does very well and that's why I wanted to say, I asked Jeffrey, like, hey, all right, there's, there's so much involved here. Maybe you have somebody take care of the draft if Howie's not doing the yeah. best at that, but he's doing so much better at these other areas. And, and you can have different guys handle different parts. You can afford that on your billion-dollar payroll. It's okay. Well, you keep uh, pushing that agenda. I like that one there, Rob. That's get somebody <laughs> else out there to make the pick. He's Rob Motti. Uh, you can follow him at Rob Motti on Twitter uh, from the Associated Press. This Eagles offseason, it's given us a nice ride here because it's going to be interesting. Who are they going to sign to be uh, hire to be the coach? The free agency, the draft. We got plenty more. And Rob, we always appreciate your time, man. You got it, fellas. Have a great day. And he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.